Welcome to the ultimate Azir guide. First off, I need to give you a fair warning about Azir. Azir is very difficult, but you probably already knew that. Azir's made for pro play and not solo queue, and you can definitely feel it. Becoming a good Azir player requires a level of dedication that is unheard of from any other champion. If you're only in it for the elo, you will feel like you got ripped off. But when you want to feel like the Emperor controlling an entire army who laps as he annihilates his enemies who can barely control their overloaded champions, then Azir is the champion for you. He's not the only mage that can take over a game, but no other mage will look this f***ing cool while doing it. Alright, before we get into the basic stuff like runes and items, you're gonna need to choose a playstyle. So, what'll it be? The one-of-a-kind long-range poke mage who also has the ability to do flashy engages? Or would you prefer the closer-range DPS mage who laughs in the face of tanks? Basically, the first important thing you need to know about Azir is that everyone has their own way of playing him but pretty much all of them will fall under one of these two definitions. A poke or burst playstyle, or the damage per second playstyle. Each style has their own advantages. With poke, you'll be doing, well, more poke damage. It's a lot safer and longer ranged. You basically use your abilities off cooldown, and you're probably gonna do more montage plays. The poke playstyle is definitely easier, and it is heavily favored in the current solo queue meta, and has been for years. Moving on, with the DPS playstyle, you try to get as much damage per second in as possible. You'll have to use your abilities more sparingly. Your soldier placement needs to be on point because your cooldowns are so much longer. With DPS, you're gonna have to play a lot closer to your enemy. You also don't want to go for montage ults as often, because it'll stop your DPS. While all of this makes DPS Azir more difficult, there are some upsides to it. For one, you're not as reliant on mana because of the efficient soldier placement. And in the late game, you absolutely annihilate tanks. In a coordinated team, where you have reliable peel and setup, DPS Azir is 100% the way to go. This makes DPS Azir really thrive in Clash. So, if you're a solo queue player, does that mean you should always go poke Azir? Well, sort of, but not exactly. You see, for the first time in probably like four years, DPS Azir finally got an indirect buff, that being the durability patch. I mean, overall, the current state of the game definitely still favors poke, but for the first time in a long time, more Azir players are getting into a Leandri's build, so try DPS and see how you like it. Because in fact, statistically, DPS Azir is about two million times more fun. All right, one last thing before we get into the abilities. I created the scale to help you quickly visualize how well a rune or item fits into a poke or DPS playstyle. To give you an idea on how it works, I'm going to place Azir's viable roles on it and explain why I place them where they are. Starting off with mid lane, I'm gonna place it slightly towards poke, because while both playstyles work in the mid lane, the meta definitely favors poke. If you're playing Azir top, nobody's gonna outrange you, which makes it great for the DPS playstyle, but poke is definitely still going to work. And if you're playing support Azir, the only utility you can really bring to the table is poke damage and alt engages, so poke is the only playstyle you should go. Now for this guide, I'll assume you know what his abilities do. This part is more going to be about how you use them efficiently, as well as some tips and combos. Starting with W. There isn't really anything special about W on its own, other than being able to attack through something for some extra range and damage, if you can even call it that. It used to be a really important skill to learn to attack over minions to harass your enemy lane opponent. But nowadays it does so little damage, I can't really say that it's worth learning for the laning phase. 
It's still slightly useful for wasting the enemy's bone plating or Yasuo passive, for example. What is really important, though, is soldier placement. The positioning of you and your soldiers is by far the most important thing when it comes to playing Azir. This will just come down to a lot of practice. But soldier placement has its own segment later in the video. You should max W second. Some people actually like maxing W first for the attack speed. Now I don't think it's a good idea, but I think it's worth trying to see if you like it. And there's almost certainly matchups where it's a great idea. But I would definitely go with Q max though. In the early game, Azir's only opportunity to do damage is poke damage. You can't really get a lot of DPS in there. Maxing Q helps with that. Attack speed, not so much. Moving on to Q, here's where we actually can start talking about combos. No matter how you're playing Azir, Auto Q Auto will be your normal poke combo in the lane. Now I see a lot of new Azir players follow this combo too literally. Almost everything about playing Azir is situational, including your basic poke combo. It's called Auto Q Auto, but what it should be called is Auto as many times as you can, Q, and then Auto as many more times as you can. I see a lot of new Azir players lose out on damage because they really just auto Q auto in every situation, no matter how many autos they could get out otherwise. And remember, soldier auto attacks cannot be cancelled in any way, so you can really wait for the last millisecond before using Q. This is really important, especially when you're playing with Hail of Blades. You can miss out on a shit ton of potential damage. There's also a common misconception that Azir's Q resets your auto attack. It does not. E is where all the magical combos happen. W, E, Q is the drift. And if you use any other name for it, you are officially cringe. It's really not that hard to pull off. The real difficulty comes from getting the max range out of it. Basically pressing Q as late as possible. Don't forget about placing soldiers over THICK WALLS for more distance. If you're just starting out, I recommend you focus on other things before trying to get the max range out of your drifts, because it is devastating if you mess up. Ah! And doing a perfectly timed drift can be very buggy. Drifting is very useful, even without your ultimate. And not just for dipping out of a bad situation. Or, or you know, just get body blocked. Most mages can't do shit if they miss their stun. You can just drift into them and create immense pressure or even get a kill. But wait, there's more. Call now and you'll get a free shield and an extra soldier charge for hitting an enemy for the low, low price of 60 man and oh god, that is a long cooldown. Now we're getting into montage territory. Time to drift with ultimates. It's really not that hard. Just press R at the end of a drift. Maybe flash to get some extra range or to match theirs. Keep in mind that Azir's ult combo is really slow and pretty easy to flash. Oh, and especially later on, you can use it sideways for extra range. If you're really good at drifting, Azir's ult kinda becomes more difficult, because when you get a buggy drift, you don't really know where the server's gonna place your ult. And at that point, it's just a guessing game. Azir's ult is full of weird quirks and interactions, and I can't really go into them all, so you'll have to just learn them as you go. Some of them will be helpful, some of them aren't, and for some reason it can be stopped by Yasuo Windwall. I have one last random tip for you. Azir's ult cast time is slow, but that's not all bad. You can use that to your advantage. If someone is chasing you, and they're trying to dash as soon as they're in range, casting your ult will make you stand still, allowing them to get in range, then your ult will immediately cut them off. The one caveat is, you do need to predict this correctly which is kind of just a part of hitting slow abilities when I think about it. Anyways, that's about it. Whoa, 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 Now, now, don't immediately go ulting the entire enemy team for your Azir montage. It doesn't work like that. No matter how great your ults are, you're still a squishy mage. Don't worry, you'll learn that pretty quickly, though. It, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. You should almost never be the first person to engage in a teamfight, no matter what the angry Yasuo says it's not your top priority to engage, it's to deal damage. Using your ult to protect yourself is more important than using it for montage plays. If you know that you'll be able to safely deal damage after ulting, then you can go for it. Having Azanya's, Crown, and believe it or not, Cloud Soul can really help you survive after a big ultimate. Now there's also a combo that we call the Revenant. This is where you ult right after pressing Q to kind of take the enemy with you. 
Now on its own, this combo would be really difficult, but it's also super buggy. You actually have to spam the Alt key after pressing Q. Normally just double tapping will work, but not always. Don't worry though, this combo is utterly pointless. 99.9% .9 of the time you'd be better off doing a normal drift. But it just looks cool, and I will go more in depth on how to do it later. Aside from how you specifically pilot Azir, your runes are the thing that most impacts your playstyle. A lot of them will basically force you into one playstyle or the other. <sighs> Bit of a spoiler alert though. The one rune that doesn't force you into one or the other is by far the best rune for both playstyles. Which is kinda disappointing, to be honest. Let's go through them all anyways. Most of playing Azir is personal preference anyway. Starting all the way over at the DPS side is my favorite, Lethal Tempo. Now I'm gonna be honest, this rune isn't great, especially after the rework. I prefer the way this version works, but the attack speed is just so much lower than before. It still has strengths, of course. No other rune matches its late game tank shredding DPS, but it's just not as great as before. It honestly hasn't been the best option in years, but it's still my favorite. I have a crippling addiction to attack speed. Next up is Conqueror. With Conqueror, you trade off a bit less DPS for a better early and mid game rune that still shines in the late game. Now, I've never really been a fan of this rune, but its strength is undeniable, even after all the changes Conqueror's gone through. Soldier auto attacks count as spells, so you get two stacks per auto. The sustain is decent, because the heal depends on the bonus damage, and it's not reduced when it's on an AoE ability, i.e. all of Azir's abilities. It really shines against melee champions because you can easily keep it stacked. Conquer is honestly the perfect fit for top lane Azir. The perfect segue into poke runes also happens to be the perfect Azir rune, Hail of Blades. I'm not gonna lie, I dislike when there's basically a one-size-fits-all rune that is best in almost every situation. But that's exactly what Hail of Blades is. It has an insanely strong laning phase and a decent late game, and that laning phase strength more than makes up for the lower late game DPS. It even outclasses the poke runes most of the time, in the early and late game. It's honestly just the best rune in 90% of situations. The only real downside it has is it's more difficult to use over other poke runes. Moving on to the brand new rune, if this video wasn't so late, it's actually pretty good if you outrange or can get free poke damage on your enemy laner. I mean, you won't get Ezreal levels of gold, but in the right matchups, you can easily get six to seven hundred by the end of the laning phase. But when you're in a lane where you can't get free poke, you never want to look at this rune again. It feels so terrible to only have about 200 gold at the end of laning phase. It's a really fun rune, it can really help you get your late game power spike, but it's just matchup dependent. Next up we have Electrocute. This rune is quite good into melee matchups. It's the go-to for Azir players who want pressure in lane and also have the chance to one-shot people in the late game. It's a decent poke rune, easy to proc, but I'd say it's best if you're into a kind of burst Azir playstyle. Next up we have... Ugh, Arcane Comet. On its own, this rune is great, but in the grand scheme of things, this rune is not great. Let me explain. The only thing it has going for it is that it's easier to use than Hail of Blades. I honestly can't understand why it's so popular. Look at this. I'm gonna compare these two games. A 27 minute Hail of Blades game, and a almost 50 minute Comet game. Here, Comet does a little over 6,000 damage. Sounds pretty good, right? Let's look at Hail of Blades. For this, we're gonna need a bit of math. In this game, I did 105 attacks with bonus attack speed. 105 divided by 87 times 100 means 120 possible sped up attacks. 120 divided by 3 is 40, meaning if we take 40 off 105, I had 65 bonus attacks that I wouldn't have had otherwise. For this, I'm gonna assume Azir's autos do 100 damage. Before your first back, they do less, but after getting a little bit of AP, you're definitely doing more. Not to mention, by the time you have 2-3 items, you're easily doing 250. Now, even with this low estimation of damage, we still get 6,500 damage from Hail of Blades bonus attacks. Even though Yasuo's shield and dashes makes it hard to use Hail of Blades, it still excels in melee matchups. 
Against long range matchups, it's harder to utilize Hail of Blades. That's why a lot of people go Comet. But even though Hail of Blades had a more favorable matchup, my Comet game had 20 extra minutes to do damage. And it's still outclassed by Hail of Blades. Some people say they take Comet for the sorcery tree, but its best secondary runes are completely outclassed by other runes in other trees. The way I see it, you simply cannot argue that a decent Azir should be taking Comet over Hail of Blades. But, if you're starting out on Azir and you're having some trouble, take Comet. But once you feel comfortable, I urge you to try Hail of Blades. It is just so much better. Look, if you like Comet, that's fine. Take it. But at least give Hail of Blades an honest try for a week or two. It does everything Comet does, but way better. With that rant finished, that sums up all of Azir's viable keystone runes. There's obviously more keystones that are possible to take, like Dark Harvest, but that's more meme stuff for advanced Azir players. So now we can move on to... Hey! 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 Shut up! I'm not talking about Aerie! I'm serious! Shut the f*** up! I'm not doing Aerie! You... You know what? Fine! Okay. Coming in last, and definitely least... Actually, let's move this. It doesn't even deserve to be on the scale. Last and definitely least, summon Aerie. It's just shit. Dog shit on the sidewalk is more useful than Aerie. Aerie is by far worse than Comet, which is already a worse version of Halo Blades. Everyone's always like, guys, it's so good. It has a lower cooldown and you can't miss it, but you would have to miss like 50% of your Comet procs for it to even be worth it. And the damage isn't even good. It's just, it's so trash. Just never take this rune. But pro players take it all the time. <sighs> I honestly cannot fathom why on earth any professional player would ever subject themselves to this sorry excuse for an Azir rune. My one and only explanation for it is that Riot is forcing players to shoot themselves in the foot while playing Azir so they don't have to feel the wrath of Azir mains complaining about their champion every time he's on the big screen, even though the nerfs usually aren't that bad. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? Actually though, Aerie is pretty adorable. I guess that could be a reason to take it. Well, that's the only acceptable reason. All right, for secondary runes, I quickly put together some tier lists, but please make sure to experiment and pick which runes fit you best. The attack speed from Legend Alacrity is really good, even on Poka's ear. And Presence of Mind makes mana management super easy. And in case you didn't know, you can proc it with auto attacks. Triumph would be really good, but Presence of Mind exists. And, uh... Coup de grace. That one is usually the best of those three, but cut down can be great against tanks or generally good if you don't buy HP. Ingenious Hunter is insanely good when paired with Ludens. And if you're buying Crown or Zhonya's or something, you might as well take it because the other options aren't that great. Cheap Shot is all around really good. Your poke early game packs quite a punch and late game you're pretty much constantly proccing it because your Q has a really low cooldown. I didn't put anything in the S tier for the sorcery tree because I really wanted to drive home that its best options are outclassed by runes in other trees. Presence of Mind beats Mana Flow Band, and Cheap Shot beats Scorch. Some people actually feel the need to go Mana Flow Band and Presence of Mind, but I mean, come on, there's so many better ways of solving mana problems. There's Corrupting Potion, Tear, or just managing your mana for the first seven minutes and getting Lost Chapter. I really believe this is only ever worth doing if you don't buy a mana item at all. And even then, past mid-game, Azir doesn't have any mana issues anyways. Alright, moving on. Absolute Focus and Transcendence are great if you're going poke and using sorcery. I might not be giving Gathering Storm as much credit as it deserves, but even after the durability patch, I don't think games last long enough for it to be worth taking. Personally, I think cookies are busted no matter what champion you're taking them on. But for Azir, they can be very helpful when you're outranged. And to be honest, I don't really like anything else in the Inspiration Tree. I would say Resolve only works as defensive help for a closer range DPS playstyle. Bone Plating and Second Wind can help a lot in the right situations. Resolve probably holds the most unpopular runes, and that makes sense. Offensive runes are usually the better option. To kick off the item portion of the guide, let's talk starting items. I always start Dorna's Ring. AP and HP are really nice, and the mana passive combined with one mana rune makes it pretty easy to manage your mana. If you're still having trouble managing your mana, or you plan on buying a tier item, then starting Tier of the Goddess is a great option. 
Dark Seal is also a starting option, but I wouldn't recommend you do it. I only ever buy it when I back early and I've already gotten a small lead. Corrupting Potion can also be great in a hard lane, but I prefer to just back early and get refillable if I really need it. Now we get to the fun part, the mythic items. Starting with... ugh. Okay, remember when I said I don't like Hail of Blades because it's the best in 90% of situations? Well, that's exactly what Ludin's Tempest is for Pokazir. It's just the best mythic by a landslide in most situations. It's got lots of AP, ability haste, an amazing passive where the cooldown is lowered with every soldier auto, and to top it all off, flat magic pen. And on top of all of that, soldier autos will lower the passive cooldown. Ludens literally just has everything you could ever want on Pokazir. The only thing it can't do is kill tanks, but for that we have... Leandri's Anguish is also pretty great. It's outshined by Ludens in terms of poke and burst damage. Not to say that his poke damage is bad, just not as good as Ludens. If you need to kill tanky champions, Leandri's is the way to go. Leandri's should be your default on DPS's of your builds. Next up is Crown, the all-new item that finally allows for a defensive mythic item. Everyone knows it's great for those pesky assassins that try to one-shot you, but what I also love is that it allows you to fight up close. And the mythic passive gives you percentage movement speed, which is awesome for DPS's ear. It can also be really helpful for surviving montage alts. Because remember, if you don't have a safety net, you're the first one who's going to die in a montage ult. I really wish Riftmaker was the best mythic for his ear, but it's really just not that great. On his ear, the Omnivamp is actually useless. The health is decent, and the true damage really only is better than Leandri's Burn if you're up against a full tank durability patch Ornn. It also doesn't have any mana, which can actually be a good thing. See, if you're not spamming abilities, Azir isn't really that mana hungry. And if you're not that mana hungry, you don't need to buy a mythic first. I'm mentioning Imperial Mandate because you can get away with buying it on support. Ludens is probably the better option because of all the extra damage, but Imperial Mandate is a lot cheaper. It has decent damage with an ally by your side, and it can give you quite a nice chunk of HP. These last two aren't very serious options, they're more for fun. Everfrost can give you some pretty pointless CC after your ult combo, and Night Harvester lets you play like an assassin. Night Harvester was actually buffed recently and it's kind of popular on his ear right now, so I'd give it a shot, although I didn't like it very much. When you're perusing through the rift, don't forget to put your boots on. Sorcerer shoes are the best most of the time for his ear. Attack speed boots have better DPS, but sorcerer shoes outdamage them quite a bit during the laning phase, because they increase your damage on Q. I recommend going attack speed boots if you know there's a tank that's gonna give you some trouble. You can also go lucidity boots. I'd say it mostly comes down to preference if you want them or not, but they're also really cheap, which is a nice bonus. Also, do not be afraid to buy defensive boots. Magic Pen isn't gonna do much for you if you die instantly. Moving on to legendary items, we'll start with the one that probably everyone's asking about, Nasher's Tooth. My favorite item of all time, which is why it pains me to see the state that it's in. I build Nash's Tooth first every game, but that's only because I have a crippling addiction to attack speed. If you're building DPS, you should build this second. In some situations, it can even be good on Pokazir. It can help a lot against tanks, but often there's also better options. Overall, I'd just say buy Nash's Tooth if you like it. In my last guide, I assumed it was common knowledge that the passive on hit doesn't and never has worked on Azir soldiers. That, and the removal of the CDR, is just one reason why Pokazir is and has been favored for the past few years. We're not quite done with the warnings about Nasher's Tooth. It also has a slight synergy with Ludens because the attack speed will let you lower the cooldown more often. But it's really not that powerful and definitely not enough to warrant doing it often. Moving on to Azir's most overrated item, it's Shadow Flame. Now don't get me wrong, this item is great on Azir, but people just build it a little too often. Riot advertised it as an anti-shield item, but it actually just makes squishy targets more squishy, and has a slight damage increase to targets who were recently shielded. Look, it's got a lot of HP, a lot of AP, and flat magic pen. What more could you want? Well, some actual utility, that's what more you could want. Utility like you get from the great, amazing Rylai's Crystal Scepter. You spend three days on the rift building Rylai's Crystal Scepter. It'll change a man. Oh yeah. 
Before the changes, this was already one of my favorite items, but now, oh boy. The AP is pretty good, the HP is really good, and it's also super cheap. The slow allows you to get a ton of extra autos in, and it's amazing for kiting. Speaking of kiting, Cosmic Drive. Rylai slows your enemies down, Cosmic Drive speeds you up. The movement speed this item gives is really great, especially for DPS's here. The AP is a bit on the lower side, but the passive can make up for it. It also has a nice chunk of ability haste and HP. It's kind of expensive though. Rabadon's Death Camp. Great item. Big ability power. Uh, <laughs> you should really get this whenever you can, as long as it's your third item or later. Void Staff is great, even as your second item, if your enemies already bought some magic resistance. Demonic Embrace is nice against tanks, but is also generally good for some survivability, or you have a lot of HP in your build. But I feel like it falls a bit short compared to the other options, especially since Leandris has the same passive, so you're not really missing out on it. Horizon Focus is underwhelming in my opinion. You can pretty much proc it permanently with your Q late game, but I've never really felt like I'm doing more when I have it over any other item. Magi's Soul Stealer can be really risky, but god damn that 10% movement speed is fun. There's really no harm in buying Dark Seal though, it's cheap and basically worth the money without any stacks. And if it works out, you can just buy the Magi's. Zonya's Hourglass. Perfect against pesky assassins. Seekers can make laning against them a lot easier. Zonya's is also your best bet for surviving montage ultimates. But the AP is on the lower side, so I don't like it that much. Verdant Barrier is great against difficult mage matchups, and it gives a generous amount of MR. And when it's upgraded into Banshee's Veil, it gives a surprising amount of AP for a defensive item. The Spell Shield can also save you very often. Do I really need to explain this? Come on, you know the drill. Only buy Oblivion Orb when you need Anti-Heal, don't upgrade it into Morellan Omicon until you've gotten all your other items, and pray that your support buys Chemtech Putrefire so you don't have to waste an item slot on shitty Morellan Omicon. Or, you know, just don't buy it at all, because nowadays people outheal your damage through Grievous Wounds, or f***ing cleanse it. Alright, I'm basically done talking about items, there's just a few more honorable mentions. Don't be completely against the idea of buying a tank item if you really need it. Deadman's Plate, for example, has an interesting synergy with Azir. Because soldier attacks don't count as auto attacks, you never actually trigger the passive, meaning you can keep the movement speed indefinitely. Oh, and don't buy Sheen. A typical and naive League of Legends player will think that items are what makes Azir do a lot of damage. But they are so wrong. It's obviously the skin you pick. Damn, son, where'd you farm? I'm, I'm, I'm plotting up a homicide. If you unironically use SKT Azir, your personality is probably as ugly as the skin itself. Alright, let's talk about matchups. Laning against assassins can be quite difficult. Normally at level 1, you're the king of the lane. You should constantly threaten them over CS and play extra aggressive. Once they inevitably unlock their dash, you should play a bit safer. You are a squishy mage after all. But that doesn't mean stay under your tower the entire time. Dance around on the outskirts of their dash range and try to get them to use it, and afterwards you can punish them extremely hard. If possible, try to keep them in your lane by pushing them or baiting them to stay when they start to leave for a roam. Because while roaming on Azir can be great, the most consistent way to get and keep a lead is in the lane. Not to mention that following an assassin for a roam is a great way to get one shot and lose any lead you already had. Against an assassin, you should only counter roam if you can get there in time, safely, and actually do something once you're there. Otherwise, just tank the flame from your teammates and have them thank you late game. And ping, obviously. Next up, mages. If you want to know how difficult a mage matchup is for Azir, ask yourself, does this champion outrange Azir? The more range a champion has over you, the harder the lane's gonna be. Long range mages like Zarath or Velkaz are a nightmare to play against. I recommend buying at least refillable potion on your first back, and maybe even take cookies as a rune. You will not get a lot of chances to poke these guys, so take what you can and give nothing back. That means hit them while they try and see us. Also, since you will almost certainly be under tower for most of the lane, you at least have a good chance to ult them under tower after level 6. As a nice rule of thumb, you can hit the backline minions once, 
and then your ult will one-shot them, meaning the enemy will take tower aggro immediately. Against mid-range mages like Orianna, the lane can really go both ways. You will have a lot easier time poking, trading, and CSing. A lot of mages with even range will still just straight up outdamage you though, so you still gotta find windows of opportunity. Low range mages like Vladimir, you just straight up win. Trust me, they're having a horrible time. Hit them as much as you can, and kite back if they ever try anything. Eventually, your lane dominance will force them away from the minion wave, and you can easily stop them from farming. Basically, every mage has a form of CC to easily guarantee some damage. Don't forget to pressure them or even straight up dash in and fight them in melee range after they miss their CC. There's very few mages that can overpower an Azir in melee range without CC. If you're having trouble poking the enemy without getting caught, here's a tip. Don't auto-attack immediately after spawning the soldier. Move a little first. Like this, you're not forced to stand still as long, but there's a chance you get less damage off. And if their CC is a root, like Lux or Morgana Q, it won't stop your dash, and you can still spawn soldiers while you're rooted. Just make sure they aren't expecting you to stop next to them, or you'll take a lot of damage. If you're into playing Azir top, here's a few tips for you. If you're against a melee champion without a dash like Garen, you should have a very easy time keeping them under control. Punish for every CS, and before you know it, you will be very ahead. If your enemy has mobility, same things still apply, but you should be a bit more passive and keep the dashes in mind. As long as you don't get dashed on very often, you'll still have an easy time building up a lead. But maybe the best part about Azir top is watching Teemo players struggle to understand why they're losing. If you don't know, Azir soldier attacks are unaffected by his blind. While I'm still talking about matchups, I might as well talk a little bit about bot lane. If you watch my videos or streams, you know that I play a lot of Azir ADC, because somewhere in my twisted mind, I find it fun to torture myself like that. But if you were wondering, do not play Azir ADC. Every ADC outdamages you by a landslide early on, in short trades and extended fights. Having to share XP is really bad, as Azir's soldier base damage depends on champion level. And while theoretically you do have a range advantage, most ADCs have a dash, and even if they don't, they can easily tank your damage while out damaging you. And above all else, any decent support won't let you get a lot of poke damage off. Look, I like the extra challenge, but I really cannot recommend anyone play Azir ADC. Support is pretty great though. You have a lot of extra breathing room to poke and set up kills with your own. In this next section, I'll cover how to actually play Azir. Now, I'll be honest, this section is just a bunch of stream clips, but it's still the most educational part of the video, because I can show you exactly what you need to do, meaning how to place your soldiers efficiently, when to play aggressive, and when not to. Overall, just how to get the most out of Azir, because when your champion is heavily balanced around pro play, you need to be efficient. When I say soldier placement is important, I don't only mean where you put them with W, I also mean where you put them with Q. Here, while chasing Set, I Q through him, and while Azir doesn't go through the enemy, the soldier does, putting it in a great position and getting a lot of attack time. You should think about soldier range as a damage over time circle. In lane especially, you want to place your soldiers in a way that force your enemy to choose what they want to lose out on. The best example being taking damage in order to get some CS, or giving it up to save HP. That's probably the most complicated way I could have explained harass them for CSing. In this clip, you see the Orianna walk up for the cannon minion, albeit way too early, and I get some easy free damage. Afterward, my soldier is also in a great position, next to the enemy caster minions, because that's where most mages are going to be while CSing. Yeah, I, I kind of need to play some Azir mid for the guide though. So I can get clips of like farming, and then when she wants to go for CS, bam, bam, bam. Big damage for free. Now harassing over CS is a lot easier with melee champions. I hope it's obvious why. Notice while harassing Cassidy, I Q through him and not on him. This is an important habit. It keeps them in the soldier range for longer and will often get you extra attacks. Another habit you should really try to get into is to move between every auto attack 
even if you don't need to, it helps develop the habit. If you're laning against a melee champion, they will eventually have a gap closing opportunity. It's important to respect it, but not be afraid of it. In this clip, Cassidy blinks toward me, but my spacing was good enough so that he doesn't reach me, allowing me to punish him. Your goal should be to always dance right outside the enemy's range. I ended up being a bit too greedy, so the trade ends up being even after all. When attacking at any point of the game, you should always move between attacks. Again, you can't cancel soldier autos, so don't be afraid of messing that up. You should never not move between autos, because if nothing else, it helps develop the habit. This is the most important skill to have on Azir. It doesn't matter if you're playing poke, it's incredibly important. In this clip, I move in a way that Zarath isn't expecting, allowing me to not only dodge his W, but also do tons of damage to him. Yon is a commonly hated matchup amongst Azir players, but it's really the same as any other melee matchup, just a bit riskier. This entire clip is a great showcase of how I respect his available dashes, and once they're gone, I never let up on the harassment. And he's eventually forced to back. It's important to maximize your soldier damage, so try to pick the best spots to place and move them. In my opinion, the easiest place to apply this is when kiting away from someone. If someone is coming toward you, place a soldier on top of yourself, and they will either have to walk around it, which takes longer, or walk through it and take damage. After they get past your soldier, queue through them on top of yourself, forcing them to walk through or past the same soldier again. At least to me, there is nothing more satisfying in League than doing an amazing job kiting. I guess to most people this clip is boring, but oh man, look at this kiting, I live for this shit. Alright, so honestly, I'm not great at this, but it's very important to stay calm when assassins or bruisers etc jump on you. In this clip, you can really see me panic, as I do a terrible job placing soldiers, because Yasuos that spam their E off cooldown scare me. But, moral of the story, the dumbass spamming dashes doesn't actually know what he's doing. This is what it should look like when you're not panicking. Great soldier placement and great spacing. Here's a great clip, for once not against a Yasuo, where I always just stay outside of the enemy's range, which baits them to keep trying to kill me and eventually whittling them down and killing them. Azir can struggle a lot when outranged, that's what makes certain matchups brutal, and on top of that, in the early game Azir's wave clear is very bad, but it's light on mana. Here I use that to get level 2 before Brand and punish him. Against mages, you should also dance around their range, and abuse them for missing an ability once used. Moving into him like I did here is very dangerous, but if you want to win lane and not go even, there's not much else you can do. On top of outranging you, most long-range poke mages will also outdamage and outwave clear you. Like I said before though, it's not impossible. It's key to respect their range and damage. Your openings for poke damage will be a lot smaller but if you can identify them and slowly whittle their health down, while avoiding their poke and the minion aggro, you will eventually zone them away. And then finally, after all your blood, sweat, tears, and dedication, you can punish them. The reason Azir's early game wave clear is so bad is because the AoE pass-through damage of soldiers is basically useless. You should use it against minions, but don't try and harass champions with it. You'll take minion aggro and the minions definitely do more damage. It's great for Yasuo shield and bone plating though. When you're more familiar with Azir's damage, you can also face tank some burst if you know that you can deal more damage in the long run. Something I see a lot of new Azir players do is they don't utilize the soldiers they already have out on the field. For example, if you have a soldier far up in the mid lane, there's no reason for you to spawn a new one to run away with. Same thing applies if you're looking for an ult. In fact, I'll often walk up, place a soldier and walk away, so the enemy feels safe, and then I can use that soldier to then ult them, because they don't expect me to dash from so far away. This will usually only ever work one time outside of teamfights. They will learn their lesson after dying to this. Oh shit. This is a great example of how you should keep track of, and use, all your soldiers. Corky keeps coming toward me, forcing me to use another soldier. But as he disengages, I use the first soldier's position to close the gap and forcing him to flash. 
and end up still getting the assist. Because Azir is balanced around pro play, and you and me probably aren't playing in pro play, you should try and utilize every little feature that Azir has. A little later in that game, I have probably the best example of utilizing every bit of Azir's kit. Corky TPs back. I place a soldier in a way that forces him to take damage if he wants to chase me, but also right on the edge of his TP so I can hit him once regardless. He immediately dashes over, and from that point I know I can kill him. So I dash to the soldier from before, gaining a shield, an extra soldier charge, and applying a small amount of damage. The extra soldier charge gets me the 3 soldier attack speed boost right as Hail of Blades ends, getting me a well-deserved kill. <gasps> GET DESTROYED, YOU PIECE OF sh Placement of yourself is also important. This honestly isn't a great clip to show it off, but sometimes you should sort of intentionally fail a drift as to not place you in danger, but still get more room to queue. Speaking of keeping yourself safe, it's always a good idea to have at least one soldier at your disposal at all times in case you need it. Be that if your enemy randomly starts a fight and you need to fight back, or usually just to escape ganks. And remember to keep your ult to save yourself, because League players will give up even the easiest kills to have a chance at killing the squishy champion instead. Azir is very unpopular, so most people aren't used to having to keep track of your soldiers. This will net you a kill every once in a while. Just make sure you can keep track of everything else. In this clip, even though Diana originally leaves the fight, I know she's gonna come back because assassins always try and get the kill. And of course, she does come back when she thinks I'm distracted, and I end up getting three kills. Azir is all about consistency. You want to steadily scale into the late game where you shine. This is why it's a good idea to try and keep laning phase going as long as possible, as well as staying in your lane as long as possible. If you can force your opponent to stay in lane, while you force them off of CS, you're doing it right. This doesn't mean you should never roam, because you do have great roam potential with your own. But make sure it's really worth roaming. And do not let your teammates pressure you into following that Kiana roaming bot. She will 100% kill you in the jungle, and before you know it, your lead is gone. While we're on the topic of ignoring your uneducated teammates, you should almost never use your ult to try and save someone. 90% of the time, whoever is chasing your teammate will use one of their 7 dashes to kill you instead. Because killing you is pretty easy after you waste your only self peel ability on that 0 and 7 jungler. I think I've mentioned now more than enough that you shouldn't go for fancy alts just because you can, and try not to let your teammates force you into doing that either. Even the Yasuos. Now that you're this far into the video, I think you deserve a real explanation on how to do the Revenant, even if it's not usually that optimal. First, you execute a normal drift, W, E, Q, and right after Q, you spam alt. You have to press it a minimum of two times, and from my experience, that's usually enough, but sometimes you're out of sync with the ping. Your soldier also has to be behind the enemy, because you only start casting your ult after your Q cast time is finished. But behind is relative to where you're going, so be creative with your angles. Doing it over walls is not only safer, but easier, because your ult will always spawn on one side of the wall. The absolute easiest time to set it up is while getting ganked, because junglers will walk towards your tower and past your soldiers. Oh yeah, another reason why it's so difficult to set up is because most people aren't dumb enough to walk past your soldiers for no reason. Anyway, that's just about every Azir skill I could think about teaching you. I really hope you get something out of this video. Azir has brought me countless hours of enjoyment over the years, and I want to make it possible for you to experience the same joy that this one-of-a-kind champion has brought me, by helping you get past the initial learning curve. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment, or join my Discord server, or even my streams, and I'll help as much as I can. In the past, I've also coached some people on my Discord. We'd also usually join a public voice chat so everyone can join in and get something from it. So if that's something you're interested in, that's happening on my Discord. I want to truly thank you for watching, and invite you to be part of my community. 
And for those of you who are already a part of my Discord and stream community, and who knew I've been working on this video for way too long, I hope it was worth the wait. I really wish I could have finished this video when I originally planned, but sometimes the Swiss military forces you to work in a COVID call center during the month of planned unemployment that I set up for myself so that I could work on this video. It really just do be like that sometimes. Alright, that's about it. Enjoy these last few bonus clips. <laughs> Zier look viable. Okay, you can climb with the Zier. No problem if you're good at him. I mean, let's be real here. I make a Zier bot look viable. And he's playing <laughs> Aerie on stream. Aerie's so bad. I don't want to ever do that again. Did you see? That was a sick revenant. There we go. That's definitely clickable. That's going in the guide. That I'm is gonna going in the guide. In the guide? What? You're featured at 1.0 yeah. already. But drifting sands, you haven't talked about some in airy yet. I went through a lot of cringe for this, Paddy. You better fucking accept it or I'm coming to your house.